Welcome at this presentation, where I will show you how to structure your software development process in seven simple steps. It will show you how to get from an idea to a control program. Hello, my name is Ilko van der Wall. I'm the Managing Director of PLC Open. Why structuring? Why do we need structuring? Well, the requirements on the software has tremendously increased. You know that from your phone and we know it from all kinds of other environments. So that is not a one man job anymore. So you need to cooperate within a team. You need to have tools for that one. And structuring is one of the ways. And of course, software is crucial for the system quality. If you, most of the errors are in software, and that means that most of the costs related to errors are linked to software. So structuring helps you there to reduce errors. And there are, of course, many phases, commissioning, installation, maintenance, improvements, and the updates. They're all essential parts of the process. And in a structured approach, you can follow these much better in that case. And you know where to focus upon. Typical advantage of the structuring is, of course, we get a better overview. It's a better basis for internal communication between the different parties. It's, it, it helps us to focus on the problem solving basis for creating reusable code and we can call it self-documenting meaning that your successor has less problems in understanding what the program is all about and to understand where the focus is on the particulars that he wants to do software is about managing complexity because the big problem with software is is you if you double the lines of code the complexity increases exponentially and that means that if we go from the 100 to the 100,000 lines of code, that we have a serious problem there. So for that one, we need structuring too. And we need modern software development processes to help us there. You have identified different phases as in a project definition. You have a top-down approach based on functional requirements, and that matches the multiple people involved with different backgrounds. You should incorporate them all. So an example of a software development process is this what we call the waterfall model. You have clearly different phases, and you have clearly decision points between the different phases. So that helps you to make sure you, you know where you are, uh, what you're going to do in the next phase. You have something that we call a V model, where you have a link between the specifications on the left side and the verification on the right side. If you know what you want up front, you know how to test it to see if it is compliant, if it fulfills the needs. A third example is the X model for software development, where you see on top if we go from the left to the right the different faces again on the bottom you see from the right to the left that you can you get your component identification your component design your component development and with that one you create a library of reusable components which you can via a catalog make available in the next phases or the next projects yeah, that helps you to reuse to identify the reusable components and to make them available. Now, one of the issues with the, the software is that it's an endless process. We want en high en enhancements, new requirements, new functionality. We have new wishes. It's what, what, what I would like to call the never ending story of software. And we know that's all going on. Yeah? Now the question with that one is, what are we looking at if we if we couple that to the software quality factors? We want less errors. What do we mean? Is that a failure rate? Do we think about external quality, the perceived value versus the internal quality? Terms like correctness, reliability, robustness, integrity, persistence, safety. Are these the terms that we focus on? Or do we focus on the ease of use? Think about your phone. How easy is it to use certain apps? If you look to the quality factors as defined by Macal and represented in this nice tri triangle, based on the product, you see three things. Product revision, product transition, product operation. So product operation, you see these terms, correctness, reliability, usability, integrity, efficiency. In 
If you want an update, a revision, you see maintainability, flexibility, testability. And if you look to the product transition, so let's say the we want to use it in a different version of this product or enhanced product. You see portability, reusability, interoperability as the curves. Now, what are we talking about here in this presentation in this case? Structuring software development with PLC Open, we try to achieve internal software quality in the sense of understandable, reusable, verifiable, maintainable, and isolation, and that's focused again on the reuse. And we know where we are, not spaghetti codes. So how does that look in practice? Now that's where we get to the seven steps to success. And for that one, I use the definition of a fermentation control system. A fermentation, that's nice, that's making beer. So here we got this whole system where we will do the fermentation process. Yeah. So we've got a large vessel and there's a motor in it that was an agitator and that keeps stirring the liquid that's inside. So we can have a feed valve to add liquid. We have an acid reagent and an alkali reagent to control the pH value. We have a heater band to control the heat there and we have a harvest valve if the process is finalized, we want to taste our beer. We harvest there. We got a temperature sensor to check on the temperature, and we got a pH sensor to check on the pH value. Huh? Now we get to the big question how to create in a structured way the software for the control program of this? That's where the seven steps come in. Step one identify the external system interfaces. That means inputs and outputs. Inputs, temperature sensor to the pH sensor, like you saw. We want to know the positions of the valve, we want to control the motor, and we got outputs to the valve, to the motor, and to the heat, heater band. Yeah, we, now, what do we mean with these inputs and outputs? Now, it, this is the flow of information towards a program. So I've got a temperature sensor, it has an analog value that goes into an analog input module that transfers it to a digital value. Then we have part of the program, the delinearization, and that's the input for the computer program. Nowadays, you see a lot of networks, so field buses. So I have an IO bus and an intelligent temperature sensor that via communication module gives it digital value to a system, but because it's an intelligent fact sensor, it can be that the linearization is done already. So we know the value and we know its range and we know its position in that case. Yeah? So that's more directly fed into the computer program. Now, if we look to this com computer program, we suddenly see this value coming out, all zeros and ones. Now, what is this? Is this a reference to a physical memory location telling us where the value is? Or is this the physical input? Is this a value? And is this the temperature? Is that in Fahrenheit or Celsius or Kelvin? What is it? And for that reason, we give it a name. That's the first step. So let's call it temperature sensor one. Yeah. We define that once, that name, and we use it throughout our whole, whole project. We use it by its name. Coupled to that one, we want to know what is it? What is this temperature value? So we give it a data type, an integer in this case. An integer can be 16 bits, 32 bits, 64 bits, so it can be a huge value in that sense. But if you define it once, and the editor will help reducing the errors because now we know what it is. It is a temperature sensor one, it's a data type integer. And with that, we can look to all the inputs, temperature sensor 1, integer, pH sensor, we make an integer, actual position valve 1 and valve 2, also integers, and the velocity of the mixing motor, let's take that a real. The outputs, we can set the set position valve 1, set position valve 2, integers, the velocity of the motor, a real one, and the heater band, boom. We switch it on or we switch it off. These are all the variables and the data types to it. There are more. No? Bull byte, you saw one bull. Date, time, time of day, all these values that we need to know when it happened. 
a string for text, for instance. So you can send a message to your HMI, your human machine interface. You've got all kinds of enumerated data types, subrange and arrays. I won't go in detail here, but you make sure you there is more to it than just the integers and the bool. The nice thing on top of that one, you can create your own data types. Yeah? If you have a special structure that you need, you can identify it, you can define it, and you can reuse it over and over again after your definition. So example can be my temperature controller with some PID inputs where I'm, I'm sure that this is my structure. These are the values that I need in the structure. Let's go back to the seven steps. This is step two. Define the main signals between the system and the plant. Then let's assume that the system is part of a larger operation, which we call plant. And in this case, we just look to the vessel and the things that are there. So there's not much coupling to the plant here, but it could be other vessels where the liquid is, where we fill it with, uh, even the, the, uh, to control the pH. There must be some kind of vessel there. Or we can look to the transportation system, the filling station after we harvest. Yeah? So we get beer bottles filled. The third step is we define all operator interactions. So we look to the operating personnel now. Yeah? What does it do in interaction override and supervisory data? And for that one, we define a simple one, a simple operator interface with a start button, a stop button, and a duration input. And we want to know how long the process will take. Now we have defined all the interfaces. Yes. And we also define, of course, the related names and data types. For the start and stop button, that can be bulls. Yeah? Duration is typically a time input. And other data, for instance, for messages, we could use a string type or date stamps to know when something happens and those information. Step four, the next step is we break down from the top in logical partitions the whole process, all steps that we have to go through. So we see here a main sequence, filling, heating, agitating, fermenting, harvesting, the nice part in it, and we have to clean it, of course, to recycle this main sequence. And that is supported by valve control for the valves, temperature control for the temperature control, agitator control for the motor, and pH control in order to to make sure we keep the right pH value. Step five, the definition of the required POUs, program organization units. There are three types, function, function blocks, and programs. And I'll explain you very quickly where this is all about. First is function. There are standard functions defined, like addition, or sinus, cosinus, and, or, min, max. And you can define your own function based on this one. And this is an example of a simple function. Yeah? You have some inputs, have an output, and there you go. And you got function blocks. And function blocks, they have also standard function blocks, additional supplied function blocks. And you can create your own defined function block. And whatever you do, all function blocks are highly reusable in the same program, different programs or different projects. Yeah? So if you look at an example of a function block, this one has three inputs and a bool. So it's, it is dealing with the hysteresis, which you see in the magnetic world. So it is not a, a consistent line, it is the hysteresis form. It doesn't really matter what it does, what is important that this is the interface of it, your inputs on the left, your data types to it, your name conventions, output on the right. And internally it will have code, and that's a definition of what it will do, but it does not mean that you need to see the code. And perhaps you are not even allowed to see the code, but you can use the functionality on that level. Right? And you can extend this a functionality by adding more of these function blocks together and create a higher level function block. You can reuse that part. So with these POUs, program organization units, these, these functions and function blocks, your application program 
can look like a jigsaw puzzle of all these predefined functionalities and that makes your program itself much smaller and much more controllable and that gives you advantages yeah, you create your own function block lab libraries like mentioned already they are highly reusable they are tested and document you make them accessible worldwide you reuse them as much as possible and then you change your your program your application program more to this jigsaw puzzle which is a network of calling functions and function blocks and with that one you can save easily on your next project i mentioned here 40 percent i've seen uh, values of 60 percent and even higher than that it is very much on how you at what level you can define your function blocks there you. so let's go a little bit back step five was the definition of the required PUs. Yeah, so using the definition above and the representing in this in a graphical way, come to this part. You see the logical partitions, main sequence, temperature control, pH control, agitate control, valve control. Those are the PUUs in this case. And they are supported by the inputs on the left side, including the operator uh, start, stop and duration inputs. Yeah, and the outputs on the right side to make sure we control those parts. So this is basically the fermentation control program at a higher level. Now, if we zoom in into the main sequence, we and we represent that in what we call sequential functional charts, you see S1 as the initial step, and that's coupled to something that's called initialization. So that's the action block. In, in, in step one, we do these actions, initialization. And when we fulfill certain conditions, we go to S2, where we do filling. And after we've reached a certain level, we go to S3, where we start heating process. And if you reach a certain temperature, the fermentation process starts in S4. Yeah? So you see that the transitions are simple in this case. And we have a good... Well, what we call self-document. We know where we are and it's much easier for the operator to understand the process. So sequential function chart is a powerful graphical technique for describing the sequential behavior of the control program. And as you see, we have a sequence in it. We can partition the problem very easily with it. It shows the overview and, and that's also suitable for rapid diagnostic. It will save you time there. The basic elements are the step with the action blocks and transitions, and it supports for alternative and parallel sequences. So again, this is a short example of a sequential function chart, three steps, two transitions, and two action blocks, and use this for alternative sequences. Think about checking your conditions your error conditions if it's all still okay can i start the process do i have sufficient um, uh, liquid up front no? that i cannot run out there yeah? you can do all kinds of alternative sequences for checks the action blocks and the transitions can be programmed in any of the four ic programming languages and that means you can have these four two text rules up uh, on top instructor list structure text and two graphical one function block diagram and a letter diagram and they all show here the same problem yes just a different representation of what you're used to or what you feel most comfortable with or which you suits the problem that you need to solve best the next step step six the definition of the scan cycle requirements for the different parts of the application. In this case, we only have one cycle. We have not many checkups there, but it can be again coupled to a filling or transportation system or checking the boundaries and the error conditions. In that case. And then last but not least, step seven, of course, the configuration of the system. That means the definition of the resources the task and linking program to the physical I.O. Where are we there? Now, let's first look to the software model to understand where, where we are there. The configuration is what we need in total to fulfill our all our requirements for this process control part, this, this control part. 
Within a configuration, one can define one or more resources. And resources are the processing capabilities, the CPUs in your system. And within a resource, I can define one or more tasks. And tasks control program or parts of the program like function blocks, function and function blocks. Between these, we can have global and direct variables and find the access parts, we can do the communication there. Now, if we compare this to a conventional PLC, you see we can do a lot more. A conventional PLC does normally, it has one resource running one task and uh, running one program. So it's an endless loop in reading the inputs, do the calculations and set the outputs. In IEC 611.31.3, we can do much more. We can identify multiple tasks and get them time-based or event-based. And we can link those to make sure that this, that we can use the resources that we have optimal sense in that case. So we go much further then. So I recap step seven. We are in step seven, configuration of the system. We need to defin uh, de define these resources and tasks and linking the programs with physical OO. This is where we really map the naming and the data types to a physical location there. So that's very much depending on the system involved. If there's a communication bus or if there's analog inputs and outputs. And it, it depends on if this includes the physical mapping of these symbols to the I.O., like mentioned, this linking to the CPUs, the processing power in the system, and how much scan cycles do we have? How do we do that? Very much like shown. And with that, we came from an idea of making beer to a program. This is the application. And we did that in seven steps. So I'll conclude this point. The software development process has changed. We have more requirements, more functionalities, more code, more people involved, more requirements and wishes. So the structuring and decomposition are essential part of this modern software development process. This helps you to get your errors out of your system as soon as possible, as early as possible, at, at the least cost. It helps you with your installation phase. The people who install it can very much easier understand where the errors are, where the problems are, and find them and help them. Even if you have updates and your maintainability for your successors, it's much easier to understand this part. And I hope I showed you that PLC Open has the right basis for this to fulfill your requirements. And in general, PLC Open tries to help you by harmonizing the way people look to control because we did not talk about any supplier here or any platform that you run on. We still can do create this application program on a higher level that shows you that this is really true. We harmonize the way people look to control. It's more than logic. We have motion, we have safety, we have communication via OPC UA, we support exchange via PLC Open XML, we give training guidelines and uh, have all kinds of specifications there that help you to improve the quality of your software itself. And overall, our goal for that one is to create efficiency and automation. So that's our tagline in our, in our lo logo. For that one, we need your support too, in whatever way and whatever you are. If you are a user, a supplier, or an a educational institute, we together can be stronger in that sense. So we need your support. For more information, check our website, plcopen.org. There is a newsletter, which we are on a regular basis send out and it keeps you updated. Um, you can subscribe to that one. So thanks for watching. I hope that we will meet in the future. Um, where there will be, uh, are more and will be more movies available. So follow us and keep in contact. Thank you very much.